please be seated. <clears throat> and uh, tonight we're going to consider two scriptures. Uh, this uh, afternoon, first we're going to consider 2 Samuel chapter 23, and then Ephesians 5 verses 17 through 19. But if you could first turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23, as we read the first two verses, and we consider the words of God concerning David. Well, please give your attention once again to the hearing of God's holy and inspired word, the very words of God communicated to us through Holy Scripture. 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 through 2. Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. And please turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 in your New Testament, 17 through 19. And give your attention once again to the reading of God's holy word. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Amen. Once again, may God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's pray for the preaching now. O Lord, our God, we come to the preaching of the word, and we come to the preaching of a matter that is holy and entirely spiritual, as all things, of course, in the word of God are. But Lord, as we consider this spiritual matter of your praise, Father, we pray for the preacher, that the very spirit that spoke through David's mouth would enable the preacher to discharge his duty faithfully, that he would preach the whole counsel of God, that he would decrease, Lord, and that you would overshadow any sinfulness in the preaching of the word. You would overshadow any sense where the man might wish to rob glory from God, that you would overshadow any areas where the man might teach in error. O oh Lord, we pray that you would be glorified, Christ would be exalted, and that the man behind the pulpit wouldn't be seen whatsoever. And so, Lord, as we come to hear this matter tonight, we pray that you would help me speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. And we ask that that Holy Ghost would not only be on the preacher, but also on every ear that hears, and especially the heart's that will hear this word. For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this afternoon, beloved, our theme concerns the authorship of the songs that we praise our God with. To recognize that the author of the 150 Psalms is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And that as the author of the Psalms is perfect himself, the songs that he authored are perfect as well. That as the divine author of the Psalms is so far above every other composer, the songs that we sing that he has composed are so far above every other human composition. That there is nothing Nothing we can sing in worship more worthy than the Psalms because he who inspired it, he who will be praised by them, supplied his own praise and has supplied his own words by which to praise him. And in that truth, we find that the words of Calvin in the preface to the Genevan Psalter is true. 
Moreover, that which St. Augustine has said is true. No one is able to sing things worthy of God except that which he has received from him. Therefore, when we have looked thoroughly and searched here and there, we shall not find better songs nor fitting for the purpose than the Psalms of David, which the Holy Spirit spoke and made through him. Today, we see that no songs of praise written by uninspired men are suited in that same manner for worship because none have God as their author. God takes his praise so seriously. He takes the praise, the sacrifice of our lips so seriously. Friends, you need to get this tonight, that he has penned the very praise he wishes to receive. And no man has the warrant to do what God has done, which is to supply his own praise. So with that in view, and this will be the last sermon on exclusive psalmody as we deal with this final objection and final objection that uh, uh, men should be able to write praise for God. With that objection in view, our time is divided into the three headings on your bulletin. The first is that you are to sing the psalms as the spirit songs. Second, you are to sing the psalms as new songs. And third, you yourself, as you sing the Spirit songs, are to be filled with the Spirit by faith, or else your psalm singing is of no value, no value to yourself, and no value to God either. So first, sing the psalms as the Spirit songs. And in this first heading, I want us to recognize that what we call the Psalms of David, which is what the Bible calls them, of course, is in actuality truly and really the Psalms of the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Well, it is because the Psalms are Holy Scripture. And what does the Scripture say of itself in 2 Peter 1.21? For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by who? The Holy Ghost. It should be without dispute then that the author of the Psalms is not David ultimately or Asaph or any of the other authors of the Psalms, but God himself. Return back to 2 Samuel 23, 1, our first text that we read, and hear what the Holy Spirit, this is the Holy Spirit's commentary on David. He calls him the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. So first, consider how high and exalted King David was. His qualities, his qualities, greater than any other songwriter today, friends. He was raised up on high by the Lord himself. He was called the anointed of the God of Jacob. God chose him out of all the people in Israel and anointed him. And he's called the sweet psalmist of Israel, isn't he? And sometimes we misunderstand what God means by that. The sweetness there is not so much about David and his character, but the sweetness there is about the qualities of his work as a psalm writer, that they are sweet compositions and they are delightful in the sight of God. That they are sweet in God's ears. And you think about it, what compositions today have such a promise from God that they are sweet and delightful in his ears? Who could dare say even today, before we get on to verse 2, I am a sweet psalmist of the church. But David was anointed and he was appointed to write sweet words of praise For God's people. But listen, after hearing the Holy Ghost's testimony about Jesus, about David rather, listen to the words that came out of David's own mouth in verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The Holy Spirit, friends, spoke through David. This is the same doctrine in 2 Peter 
that we considered. That the Holy Spirit's word was in his tongue when he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. That when he wrote these psalms, he was an instrument of the Lord. And so you must get it clear, no matter how many times we write the psalms of David on our psalm book, that these are the expressions not of David, but of the Holy Ghost. And these words are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And every psalm that is penned, not just the ones David penned, are the expression of the Holy Ghost. For as we have heard, the prophets spoke the words of the Holy Spirit. And all the praises of God's people were prophetic, meaning that they were inspired words from God. And without prophets today, I'll come to this later, who can write such sweet words For God's people, who can write such sweet words that are pleasing in God's ears? And the answer is, of course, no one. And what you need to understand when you consider the Psalms as opposed to other songs is that as they are the scripture, they have the very quality, every quality that belongs to the Holy Scripture. They cannot be broken, as Jesus has said. They are infallible. They are incapable, incapable of being an error. For in them, as we heard this morning in Psalm 95, who speaks? God speaks and not man. And what is the aim, as our confession says, of the Holy Scripture? To give all glory to God. And is that then not what is fitting for the praise of God, the very subject matter whose aim is to give all glory to God. The words that also have the aim of our Savior who said, these words testify of me. Friends, what better words, what more perfect words could we sing to God than words that are designed to give all glory to God? And would you stake your life on the words of a mere man giving all glory to God and testifying the whole counsel of God concerning Jesus Christ. No, you could not. And as the word of God, they have so many promises attached to them, beloved. You have the promise that the author of them, the Holy Spirit, will work through them. And as they are the words of God, they are a means of grace. As we heard providentially, I thought, how wonderful. In the morning sermon, we saw Isaiah 6, providentially. And in the afternoon sermon, we see Romans 10, verse 17. And what is the promise attached to the word of God in Romans 10, 17? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. What words of men have such a promise attached? What songs have a promise that faith may come to those who hear it by hearing the songs that are sung? No other songs have such a promise. That's why you consider it. When we do our open air preaching and evangelism, we sing the Psalms. What a wonderful testimony. These are the words of Christ. These are the songs of the Spirit. And we pray that the Lord might even bless them, not just the preaching, which of course is ultimate in faith coming by the hearing of, but that even in the psalms that are sung, as we sing of our sweet Savior, that men might come to faith. And the psalms also have every other quality of the scriptures. What do even our young boys and girls uh, memorize in 2 Timothy three sixteen through 17? That all scripture, all scripture, this includes the Psalms, is given by inspiration of God what we have been hearing tonight and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be uh, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What songs have that promise attached? These are the promises attached to the Holy Scripture because these are the words of the Holy Ghost, my friends. And they are not given once again to anything else man may write. And just think about it historically. Uh, We've already considered the first five, six centuries of the church. 
but also past that in the Reformation. At every juncture, friends, in church history where the word is found in low esteem, the Psalms are pushed away. Every juncture. Whenever in church history the word of God is in low esteem, the Psalms are tucked away. And that might tell you something about the current age we're in. Is this an age where the word of God is esteemed? Hardly so. Hardly so. But you think about those first 500 years of the church. You think of the Reformation in Geneva, Scotland, and the Netherlands. What was sung exclusively? The Psalms and the hymns were put away. Uninspired hymns, that is, were put away and not used in the praises of God's people. In this series so far, we've spoken of Scotland, we've spoken of Geneva, and not the Netherlands much, so I will not leave out our Dutch brethren, but to add to your list, the Synod of Dort in 1578 decreed this. The Psalms of David, translated by Pieter de Thien, shall be sung in the Christian gatherings of the Nether- Netherlands churches, as has been done until now, excluding the hymns which are not found in the Bible. All the Reformed churches, friends, all of them, Put away uninspired praise. Why is it that in the Reformation, the Psalms arose to the forefront of praise again? Because as Josiah did, when he discovered or rediscovered the beauty of the law, when the beauty of the word was rediscovered and treasured by God's people in the Reformation, when they saw the sweet Psalms as the words of the Holy Ghost, and they heard our God speak to them. They fell in love, of course, with the Psalms and wouldn't do anything, have anything to do with the uninspired words of men because they saw that the Reformation was all about the word of God. And what else would they sing? And they heard the voice of our beloved Jesus Christ in them, the voice of my beloved. And as it has been in every time past, I believe that psalm singing will be a marker of revival and reformation when it next comes into these lands. So in October then, that month where you are called to remember God's mighty works in the Reformation. Interesting how many events occurred in October, but that's that's another topic. On this month, let us by God's help remember the qualities of the word of God. Let us not forget the qualities of the word that bring reformation and revival. And let us resolve to have first place, only place in the singing in public worship given to the Psalms and that God may do another great work among us. And so I also want you to remember the work of the Holy Spirit as the author of the Psalms and consider him as our psalm writer. What what did Jesus say before he left in John 15? But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit as Comforter, Counselor, is that he testifies to you of Jesus Christ. Fittingly so, as Revelation 19.10 says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. His role in the psalm book and throughout the scripture is to testify of Jesus Christ. And to understand that the Holy Spirit testifies of Christ is to understand why Christ said in Luke 24 that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand what? The scriptures. But on top of testifying of Jesus Christ, what the Holy Spirit does is he testifies of your need for the Savior. You remember one of his great works is to convict you of your sin in John 16, verse 8. Jesus said, and when he is come, speaking of the Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Is it not telling that the Psalms do that very thing? Think about it, brethren. When Paul, the apostle, wanted to teach on the doctrine of total depravity, where did he turn? In Romans chapter 3, 
he turns to Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. Psalm 14, 3, they are all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Psalm 53, 1 through 3, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from the heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. When was the last time you sang an uninspired hymn like that, my friends? You won't because the Holy Spirit's role is to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. These psalms are cited by Paul in the great chapter of Romans 3 because the Holy Ghost inspired him to write Romans 3 and he was reproving the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. And the Holy Ghost moves the apostle to cite his own words in the psalms to show our need for what? The justification that comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ because all of us are sinners And the Psalms teach that, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why in Romans 3, that very chapter that teaches that, he uses the Psalms. And do you remember how we considered Colossians 3.16 in our first sermon on exclusive psalmody? What did the text say? That the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and what? Admonishing, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Do you see how the admonishment over our unrighteousness and our sinfulness comes in the psalm book? They convict us of our sin because the Holy Ghost inspired them, and that is his role. I'll ask again, how often are you admonished? How often are you admonished over your sinfulness in uninspired praises? How often do you sing words like that of Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. How often do you sing praise like this from Psalm 73, 22? So foolish was I and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. Oh, so many Christian ministers would say that is unsuitable, unsuitable for singing. But friends, we must sing it, otherwise we will never see our need for the Savior. Or what about Psalm 95, which we considered this morning, or Psalm of the Month? Harden not your heart as in the provocation. How often have you sung praise in the church against hardening your heart to the word of God? All that to say, friends, the character of the author of the Psalms shines forth through them. And what is the character of the author of the Psalms? Holiness. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the author of the Psalms. Next month in Psalm 96, verse 9, our Psalm of the Month, what does it say? Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Who is going to teach you about praising God in the beauty of holiness but the Holy Spirit? And the sweetness of the Psalms is also found in their diversity. You know, the Holy Spirit is true to his promise that by them, The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Holy Spirit has anticipated and given to you every kind of praise. He is God, of course. He knows what you need. He knows perfectly what we need to sing. Literally, every lawful emotion for you to express before your God is found in the Psalms. The expressions of great joy this morning in Psalm 95 the expression of grief over hard providences or grief over your own sinfulness, expressions of righteous indignation against the unrighteousness in the world, the committing of vengeance to God, and so on are all found and all given to you in the psalm book because the Holy Spirit knew what you need to sing. So that you can sing, just think of this, in the space of six psalms, I'll just give you a quick smattering here. You can sing in Psalm 35, 9, My soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. 
But then in Psalm 42, 6, just a few psalms down, you can sing, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. How often do you sing that in uninspired praise? Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. So that you can then sing in Psalm 43, Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. In the space of six psalms, you see a tremendous diversity of praise. And only the author of the psalms, the Holy Spirit, could anticipate all, all that you need to say to the Lord in your praises, friend. You will not find in a hymnal anything like what you're going to sing in the psalms. And so many people are discouraged when they come to public worship especially when they feel overwhelmed with their sinfulness or they are experiencing grief because the words of these hymns, they just mean nothing to them because, oh my God, my soul is cast down. Judge me, oh God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation and how it will be that we must sing words like that more fervently in the upcoming years. Nothing like it in uninspired praise. You know, friends, it is only the prosperous and therapeutic West that could ignore so many needful psalms. But our persecuted brethren, you know, often they find so little of value in man's hymnals to sing in their distress. But the great author of the psalms knew that his people would be persecuted for Christ's sake. That was Christ's own promise. And that we must sing praise and distress. Consider Psalm 140. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits that they rise not up again. Beloved, try to find words like that in most hymnals. Not going to find it. And if you did not have warrant from God to sing such words, we would not dare sing them, would we? But as we have warrant from God to sing them, we must sing them as our praises. As you heard last month in Psalm 94, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, we commit vengeance to the Lord, for the word of God says he will repay. And we praise him for that. And we plead with him for it, that we would not take judgment into our own hands, but we would commit it to he who will repay our enemies who persecute us for Christ's sake. And when you sing such words, you express your faith, friends, that God's justice will prevail. Do you know how many of our persecuted brethren who have been slaughtered for Christ have grown to love the Psalms because they express thoughts no man has ever composed for them. Uh, I believe in the 90s, in an international symposium on the Psalms in Glasgow, uh, there were participants from Rwanda, Nigeria, and Pakistan, and they all spoke of how the Psalms alone helped them deal with the great brutality that each of these people had experienced. An Anglican priest spoke of how his entire family was slaughtered in one single day in the Rwandan genocide of 1994. And he said that the Psalms alone spoke of God's justice to set things right, friends. And by committing vengeance to the Lord, the, this is what we talked about in Psalm 94. It seems counterintuitive. But by committing vengeance to the Lord, the man said he was able to have a spirit of forgiveness because he knows that the Lord will set all things right and that he does not have to take it in himself. Even though his family was bit butchered, he could sing that God would make things right. And others from those nations said in the symposium, from other persecuted lands, whether Nigeria or in Pakistan, said, we need these psalms. We need these psalms. For no other songs are going to commit such things to the Lord. All that to say, the divine author of our songbook anticipated and provided for our every need. If you've ever felt 
the praises of the church to be shallow and unable to express your current frame. Sing these psalms, friends. Look up, as I have exhorted you before, through a topical index to see what it is that you are feeling, the things you are suffering, even the things you are rejoicing in, and sing God's word to him. There is always a psalm for every, every lawful emotion and feeling that you are going through. Because the Holy Spirit, the great comforter, knew what you needed to sing. And even words that might seem uncomfortable for your singing of praise, he says, are sweet and delightful to his ears. When he called David the sweet psalmist of Israel. That's why even the imprecatory psalms are sweet in God's ears and you must never doubt it, beloved. Believe it by faith. And so, all that said, when it comes to praise songs, here's a very simple division you can make, boys and girls. You can divide all compositions into two categories. And this is going to seem very unfair, but it's the truth. There are those songs that are written by God, and there are those songs that are not written by God. And which are you going to sing? What songs would you sing in worship to God? The songs he wrote or the songs a mere man wrote? You saw, I'm not going to go over it again, the divine commandment to sing psalms exclusively in worship in our first sermon. But given what you see of their authorship tonight, whose songs will you sing in worship? The ones that God wrote or the ones that you flip through a hymnal and you're not even sure if the people are orthodox and some are women on top of it all? Will you honor God by singing the psalms he himself wrote that are perfect? Or will you, and I will say it, will you dishonor him by displacing his songs with human ditties? Will you, who will you look to that can write songs comparable to the Holy Ghost's work? Inspired, infallible, inerrant, whose sole concern is the glory of God. Let me make that answer easy for you. The answer is no one. You can't look to anyone. You can't look to anyone to do a better work than the Spirit. And what hubris in a man who would say he could do a better work than the Spirit. And yet, showing our lack of spirituality in this current age, the Spirit's work is often completely overlooked and ignored. It shows you, friends, that we don't esteem the word of God, but worse than that, we don't esteem the author of the word of God. Whether it is the praises of God's people or sermons that are based on out-of-context verses, readings of the word that are maybe one or two verses, if at all, we do not esteem the word of God in this current age, and it shows in our praises. You know... I am very thankful that more churches are adding psalms to their services. You're hearing about it all the, de- all the time as people rediscover the psalms. And that position is often called inclusive psalmody, where they will have psalms and then some hymns. But that position, while slightly better, is still not biblical according to the regulative principle as we saw in our first sermon. But I also want you to consider this because we don't meditate on what we do. Consider what a minister who chooses an uninspired hymn in their worship service to displace a psalm is telling the Holy Ghost, your words are not good enough. Your words are not good enough. I cannot find something suitable to sing, so I will sing the words of man. He says, contrary to 2 Timothy 3, that the words of the Holy Ghost are insufficient. I will choose what man wrote instead of you, O God. Brethren, I want, I want no business, no business with that statement to the Holy Ghost. Talk about quenching the spirit, friends. It's another reason to reject inclusive psalmody. And as a minister, I will say I have never, ever lacked for a psalm to choose in public worship. I've never found a subject matter that the psalms do not speak to. And that is because God's testimony is true, that he is faithful to provide a complete scripture. 
By faith, I believe and have found it to be true that the testimony of the word is true. It alone is sufficient for every need. The doctrine of the word, friends. The more the doctrine of the word of God comes into your mind and your heart, the more exclusive psalmody makes sense to you. Low view of the word, low view of the psalms. High view of the word and its power and its majesty and its aim, the glory of God, the more you will desire to sing only the psalms. Well, having considered the author of the psalms, I want us to consider an objection raised that we must sing new songs to the Lord. Our second heading, sing the psalms as new songs. Now I have belabored the Holy Spirit's authorship to show that no man can compare to him. And so that you might see that no man can author worship songs as perfectly as he can. But on that, some object. They say, the Psalms themselves say, sing a new song. Psalm 33, for instance, says, sing unto him a new song. Next uh, month, I believe, Song 96 will say, sing a new song. And so they say, we are to sing new songs not just the old psalms. Well, first, I want you to consider, and it might seem petty at first, but it's an important distinction as you consider authorship. The command is to sing a new song, not to compose a new song. That distinction is going to come up very soon, I hope, because you will not find a commandment and there is no authorization to compose new songs in the Bible. Certainly not in the New Testament. Zero commandment is given to compose songs. And who composed the songs of the Old Testament? The prophets. The prophets. The prophets were those who composed the songs of praise for God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit must be the author of praise to God. So that said, let us deal headlong with the objection, you must sing a new song. Lest you think that the distinction I was making about composition is a dodge. And what you must first remember, and we are prone to forget, is how the Bible uses the word new. For instance, think of it. The Bible speaks of new moons. It speaks of new covenant. It speaks of new hearts. It speaks of new commandments. And it speaks of those things as things renewed, renewed, especially made afresh by the coming of Jesus Christ. New does not always mean in the Hebrew, new as in ex nihilo, not ever having existed before. And the Hebrew word used for new in new song also has the meaning of fresh or refresh. There's a wonderful example of this language in the New Testament that we don't quibble with there, but I'd like you to look at 1 John 2, verses 7 through 11. And the reason I bring it out is because you heard preaching on this uh, from John chapter 13 about a new commandment. So 1 John 2, verses 7 through 11, I will read them to you now. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. (laughs) Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Now, we considered this theme in John chapter 13 in our last, after our last communion service. So this is a fitting text to consider so soon after. You saw then, as you're hearing now, that the commandment to love one another is an old commandment, isn't it? From Leviticus 19.18, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And John says, yes, this is an old commandment in verse 7. But look at this. In verse 8, he also says it is a new commandment, just as Jesus did in John 13. And you see 
Something old is also now something new. Why? The explanation is right here. Because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. In Christ, friends, do you remember that sermon? Uh, That old commandment becomes new when it is made full of light. When we find it becomes new, when Jesus tells us a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, why? As I have loved you, that ye also love one another, John 13, 34. There is such new light on the old commandment when you see that the Son of God in the flesh has loved his neighbor as himself, and that makes it new as we are to love each other as the Son of God has loved us. And so that old commandment, Leviticus 19, 18, in Christ is given far more light than ever before, and therefore it becomes a new commandment in Jesus Christ. In the same way, beloved, if you know anything of the scripture, do the Psalms not become new songs in view of the light of Jesus Christ? Do you not think that a psalm like Psalm 22 becomes a new song after the cross? When you see the agony of the psalmist is in actuality the agony of our Savior. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Once you might have thought that the psalmist suffered and was forsaken. But after the cross, that song, that old song, becomes a new song. Who cannot say that they sing Psalm 22 as a new song after the advent of Christ? Or what of other psalms like Psalm 72? You see with the light of Christ that the psalm, Psalm 72, was never about Solomon but was utterly about Jesus Christ when you sing. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Is that Solomon? No. It becomes a new song after Jesus Christ, for you see Christ in it. Or who can sing Psalm 110? The same way, the old way, after hearing Jesus' interpretation of it. Matthew twenty two forty one through 46, another communion text. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, How then David, doth David in spirit, there's that, that again, David in spirit, call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. Christ himself casts light on Psalm 110 to sing it as a new song, And proclaim as you sing it now, you are proclaiming his divinity by it. That Jesus Christ is son of God, David's greater son and David's Lord. When you sing the Psalms, the question Jesus Christ is constantly exhorting you to ask is this. What think ye of Christ? For Christ said that the Spirit's role is that he shall testify of me. So I want you to think about it, friends. What a terrible thing it is to abandon the Psalms that revealed Jesus so powerfully after they became new songs by the light shed on them by the gospel. What an utterly strange thing that God intended the Psalms only to be sung as shadows. But now when the light, the true light, shines upon them, then we must stop singing them? God forbid, friends. God forbid. Now is when we must sing them with more fervency. And we must sing them with joy, understanding them as new songs because we see our beloved in them. And from personal testimony... As I grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Psalms are constantly renewed in my mind and heart. 
I sing them afresh each time I sit down and consider them in the view of the gospel. Every time I preach a psalm, as I did this morning, they become new songs to me, utterly inexhaustible, as I see the unending depths of them in view of the Holy Ghost's light shed upon Christ. So the command to sing a new song is in line, in other words, with such things as seeing new commandments out of old commandments. It's in view of seeing our hearts renewed and made, what? A new heart when the Holy Spirit regenerates us. Or that new covenant, which is the same in substance as the old, which is what? Salvation by grace through faith, as it was with Abraham. But it becomes a new covenant with the light of the view of the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you see that old covenant with Abraham, you see a covenant made afresh in Christ. But the substance, righteousness imputed to us through faith in the Lord, just as it was for Abraham. In the same way, beloved, see the Psalms as new songs in light of Christ. Imagine as well, if any man today, and many do, take up the composition of new songs, saying we must sing new songs, who among us would say the spirit of the Lord spake by me, as did David? If anybody did, it would have been the apostles, wouldn't it? But they did not write any books of praise, an indicator that they saw the Psalms as sufficient for New Testament worship. And think of it, You can look through the New Testament and the Psalms are the number one cited book of the Old Testament. And as they cite Psalm after Psalm after Psalm, what did the apostles see those old songs as? They saw them as new songs in light of Jesus Christ, didn't they? And that's how they used them. They didn't write new songs. They simply cited the old ones and said, this is what the light of Christ sheds on these old psalms, and they are of use for us. And the early church followed their lead and example for six centuries, and God never again raised a sweet psalmist for the church like David. There's a reason for that. The psalms are sufficient. Consider such things, beloved. But with that, let me say it is not enough for you to recognize the psalms are the Spirit's. If you will profit from them, you must sing them in the Spirit. And that's our final heading. And so, I'd like to conclude our time by considering Ephesians 5, 17 through 19. Uh, It's a parallel text to Colossians 3, 16, but it draws out the Spirit as uh, Colossians 3 drew out Jesus Christ. Uh, We read it. It says... Verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And where do you understand the will of the Lord? It is in the word of God. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, In other words, don't be filled with the spirits, which is what wine would have been considered, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. To the Lord. So if we saw the second person of the Trinity in Colossians 3, in Ephesians 5, we find the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, in this parallel text. These are the songs of the Spirit, and we are called to be filled with the Spirit in singing them. And as I mentioned in the first sermon, the adjective spiritual here, found at the end uh, in spiritual songs, uh, in the Greek grammar, actually refers to all three components of that phrase, so that it would be speaking to yourself in spiritual psalms and spiritual hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And when the New Testament uses that word spiritual, it means spirit-inspired, which is a great calling to us, friends, to be filled with the Spirit as we sing Spirit-filled songs. This is a reminder for all of us, friends, that you can sing psalms, but you can sing them in an unworthy manner. How often do you come 
to sing the words of God, which is what we must do, but you can still sing them unworthily if you do not sing them by faith and with understanding. You know, the point of exclusive psalmody is to see God glorified and that you would also be edified. But neither of those two things happen, friends, if you will not sing with faith. If you will not sing them with understanding and in your spirit, you will not profit and God will not be glorified. So when you sing psalms, your spirit must be under the control and guidance of the Holy Spirit. You know, each month, as I did this morning, I exhort you with the apostolic command. I will sing, and that word, by the way, I'll get to. I will sing solo with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding also, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. And you think about it, why does the apostle have to say, I will sing with the understanding? Because I must understand what the scripture means. And I will also have my spirit under the control of the Holy Spirit. And we will sing those psalms with understanding as new songs, as Paul demonstrates that they are through the rest of the scripture. And that's why we give you, we give you a brief, even when we're not doing the psalm of the month, you notice that your elders come up here and we give you a brief explanation of what you are singing when you sing a psalm you must grab a hold of the meaning these are not words we babble to the lord you have to grab hold of the meaning of the psalms friends and be filled with the spirit by faith make sure that when you sing the psalms you know what you are singing make sure you see christ in them make sure you give glory to god for their subject matter And see how the words are sweet and delightful to God's ears. And that they would be the same in your mouth and in your own hearing. The Christian faith, we have forgotten this, is a faith that is a diligent faith. To grow, you must know the scripture. And you must know it by faith with the blessing of the Holy Spirit. But I'll get back to 1 Corinthians 14, 15 that I cite so often. When the apostle says, I will sing with the spirit, the word sing, sadly, not often brought out in translations, the word sing is the Greek word solo. That word that is so often used for the singing of psalms, such as in James 5.13, is any Mary, let him sing psalms, solo. And Calvin, in his commentary, translates 1 Corinthians 14.15 in that way and says, I will sing psalms, psalms with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. And his comments on 1 Corinthians 14, 15 are this. For as the praises of God were the subject matter of the psalms, he means by the singing of psalms. It's amazing, friends, how the singing of psalms is all throughout our Bibles And in recent decades, how the Christian church has missed it, though our forefathers, from the church fathers to the Reformation fathers, constantly are bringing them to our minds. There is great spiritual blindness among us. How little we know of the Holy Ghost, how little we esteem the word of God. We cry out, we want more and more of the Holy Spirit's blessing. We say we want him to revive our souls. We say we want him to revive our world, yet we avoid his songs. And it is most strange for us who call ourselves Calvinists and Reformed to abandon what our forefathers taught. But as we are Reformed according to the word, most tragic is that Reformed churches have abandoned what the word plainly teaches about praise. But I also wanted to speak a word of caution to us psalm singers. The apostle says he will sing with understanding, as I've said many times. Now what he means then is that the words of the psalms will have primacy. Because it's the words that have meaning. Many psalm singers can be like those who sing uninspired songs on this point, friends. Where the melody or the rhythm has primacy to them. Often when psalm singers get together and decide what psalm they want to sing, sometimes they say, I like psalm X or Y or Z. And the question is, oh, why do you like that song? And often it is, I like the tune it is set to, or the tune we sing it to. That's a great evil. 
that comes into the house of God, friends. A great and tremendous evil. We must have the words of the Spirit and not the tune we set the psalm to, to have primacy. We are an exceedingly sinful people, friends. We find ways to take even psalm singing and turn it to gratify our flesh and not our spirit. No, you are to sing psalms with the Spirit and with understanding, filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, today you have seen that the psalms are compositions of God, the Holy Spirit, and that no songs are worthy of being sung in worship but those composed by God. You've also seen that they are new songs as they are viewed in the light of Christ, and that you must make sure you're always singing them by faith, under the guidance and being filled by the Holy Spirit. Really, so much more could be said about exclusive psalmody, friends, and I could say much more. But I hope that the principles over these last three sermons should serve to show you the aim of what I had hoped at the beginning of our series, that we do not sing psalms exclusively in the RPCNA out of tradition. It's not just our choice of what we sing for our hymnal, but we do it because we believe the word of God demands it. Boys and girls, do not sing uninspired hymns in the worship of God. That's my exhortation to you. You've seen these past sermons that God only has asked for the singing of psalms, that they are sweet and pleasing to him, and they are a means of grace to you, young people. Grow up to love the psalms, because why? Your God loves them. Grow to love the psalms, why? Because your God wrote them. And give to your God the praises he desires. As we heard in Psalm 95 this morning, we sing Unto the Lord. Our praise is for him and not for us. And as children in the RP church, and you're not the only church, you know, the RPCNA is not the only church uh, these days. We saw how many Dutch churches and other Presbyterian churches and even Baptist churches now more and more are only singing the Psalms. You see, boys and girls, that this is all about the glory of God. And this is not a matter of compromise. And as growing up and hearing these things that so few of your peers do, you have been given such great light, such great light that others have not had. So don't turn, as in 1 John 2, from light to darkness. Love the word of God. Love singing it. And love seeing Jesus Christ, your beloved Savior, the voice of your beloved in his psalm book. For all of us then, May God make that true to us. Amen. Please rise for prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, how we thank you, Lord, that you have not left us orphans, that you have given us your Holy Spirit, and you have given us this great Bible, oh, thoroughly perfect, thoroughly inspired by the Holy Ghost. Not the words of men, but as we heard this morning, as it is in truth, the very word of God. And we're thankful, Lord, that we, your church, do not have to scramble to write songs of praise to you. That in the apostolic church, you left that church with those 150 psalms that you intended them to continue singing as new songs. Help us, Lord. Our great, our great sin is often a slothfulness about the things of God. And we confess to you, Lord, that we have not investigated. We have not investigated how these psalms are new songs in view of Jesus Christ. And yet how they astonish us when we hear preaching on them, when we hear a study on them, and we see Christ all throughout. When we hear in the New Testament how the apostles see them as new songs. Help us grow in our diligence and our love for the Psalms. Help us not sing them out of tradition. Help us not sing them loving tunes, but instead help us sing them loving them as the words of praise that you find sweet in your ears. We thank you for praises inspired, and we pray that we would all be students of your word 
to understand what each and every psalm has to say. We ask this for the glory of Christ, to whom the psalms testify, and we ask this in his name. Amen.